Well, good evening. It's good to be with you. I hear there is a uh, football game of some sorts this evening, and a football game that will decide the world champions of American football. It's not really a big deal in the world, but it's kind of a big deal to us. What if I told you that the champion had already been crowned, the parade had already been run, the ticker tape had already fallen, and the city of the winner was in celebration before the game had ever been played? It would kind of lose its entertainment value, wouldn't it? Because that's what it is. That's what a football game is. But as we've been looking at the book of Daniel, we've been seeing the end of history from the beginning. And it doesn't lose its entertainment value for us because life is not a football game where the outcome is in jeopardy, up for grabs. No, the universe is happening and unfolding exactly as the sovereign God of the universe has foreordained. And that is a tremendous comfort for us who know him, who are called by his name. Because we live in a world that is filled with the tumults and the turns of life under the curse, life after the fall, death and decay and suffering are part of our existence. And one of the effects of living in this fallen world is living under the rule of sinners as governors, as presidents, as emperors, as legislators. And if any one of us would make our way to tyrant of the known world, we would be just as much a sinner as all the rest. We've been looking at the beastly human governments as they are unfolded predictively in the book of Daniel. We looked at the four empires from Daniel's day that would be used by God to bring about his purposes. The Babylonian Empire, the Medo-Persian Empire, the Greeks, and then the Romans in two phases. And while these governments are in sinful rebellion against God by their very nature, they are on a short leash from God to accomplish his purposes. It has already been over 2,500 years since Daniel wrote, that's a long time to wait under beastly government. But it's worth the wait. I want to turn your attention this evening to Daniel chapter 7, and we're looking at two verses, Daniel 7, 13, and 14. And this really is the apex, the climax of the book of Daniel. This is the apex of the vision in the middle of Daniel 7. It is nearing the end of the section aimed at Gentile rulers here in Daniel 1 through 7. And Daniel gets a second part of the interlude, the interlude that we began last week, an interruption of God's predictions of that fourth empire, the Roman Empire. And we'll get a fuller description in verses 15 to 28 of chapter 7 next time we're together in Daniel and discover some of the details of the unfolding of the final phase of that Roman Empire. But for tonight, we get an intermission, an interlude, an interruption and a glorious one. Read with me our text for the evening, Daniel chapter 7, verses 13 and 14. I kept looking in the night visions, and behold, with the clouds of heaven, one like a son of man was coming, and he came up to the ancient of days and was presented before him, and to him was given dominion, glory, and a kingdom that all the peoples, nations, and men of every language might serve him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion which will not pass away, and his kingdom is one which will not be destroyed. This passage is good news. It's good news on top of what we looked at last week. Last week we discovered that there is an ancient of days, eternal God who rules and reigns over all things. And we discover this evening something of a coronation ceremony, the celebration of the kingdom being given from the ancient of days to one called a son of man. 
And this one has a kingdom that will last forever, a kingdom that is good, a kingdom that is in keeping with God's good purposes and his good character. This, of course, is good news for God's people languishing under beastly human government. The last king is coming. And as John has been teaching us in the book of Mark, as Jesus began his earthly ministry, he began preaching. He began preaching good news. And what did the gospel writer call that good news? Jesus preached the good news of the kingdom. That is, Jesus was preaching the good news of the very predictions we're looking at in Daniel chapter 7 tonight. And if you trace through the book of Acts, the book of Acts begins with statements about the kingdom of God, whose time had not yet come. And the book of Acts ends in Acts 28, 31 with its final record of the apostle Paul's teaching. And the book of Acts ends us with this statement, Paul went about preaching the kingdom of God. Not that it was always already here at that time in Paul's day, and not that it's here yet in our day, but the glorious good news of anticipation of the return of the king and the reign of the last king. Notice in verse 13, Daniel says, I kept looking in the night visions, and behold, here again, Daniel is captivated. He's on the edge of his seat. He's surprised by each successive scene of his vision. And what he sees now follows that four-beast vision, Babylon, Medo-Persia, Greece, and Rome, symbolized in those terrifying beasts. This fifth kingdom described here in verses 13 and 14 is radically different than all that went before. It is ruled by a different kind of king, and it is a different kind of kingdom. We're going to look this evening at the king and that kingdom. What will it be like? Well, the king himself will be divine and human. That's where we will start this evening, looking at verse 13, at the king himself. What will he be like? Daniel records in verse 13, Behold, with the clouds of heaven, one... One was coming with the clouds of heaven. There are some 70 passages in the Old Testament depicting a coming in the clouds, a presence in the clouds, and all of them are a theophany of Yahweh. All of them are God in his very presence. Listen to Exodus 16.10. It came about as Aaron spoke to the whole congregation of the sons of Israel. They looked toward the wilderness, and behold, the glory of Yahweh appeared in the cloud. Exodus 34, verse 5, Yahweh descended in a cloud and stood there with Moses as he called upon the name of Yahweh. At the establishment of the consecration of the temple by Solomon in 1 Kings 8, it happened when the priest came from the holy place, the cloud filled the house of Yahweh so that the priest could not stand a minister because of the cloud, for the glory of Yahweh had filled the house of Yahweh. Listen to Psalm 97. Clouds and thick darkness surround God. Righteousness and justice are the foundation of his throne. Fire goes before him and burns up his adversaries round about. There in Daniel 7, it captures the two sides of what we looked at in last week's part of the vision and this week's. A fiery throne out from which fire and blazing flames come in the judgment of God. And the glory of God represented in clouds. Psalm 104.3 says, God makes the clouds his chariot. In fact, of the 70 some times that clouds are used in this way, it is absolutely without doubt a theophany is occurring. That is a manifest appearance of the glory of God. What's striking here is we see those very same realities here. One appears on the clouds, and unless Daniel 7.13 is an exception to the rule, then the one we're viewing here is himself God, worthy of glory, fit to be in this same scene. This one is coming with the clouds of heaven, is a divine being. This, in fact, is a throne room coronation. Notice this one, like a son of man coming on the clouds, approaches the ancient of days. He comes up all the way up to the ancient of days, and notice at the end of verse 13, he is presented before him. 
This is the picture of a throne room coronation where a, a crown is given and an empire is handed off to one who is worthy. There is an entourage of heavenly attendants escorting him up to the glorious throne room. And notice what is given to him in verse 14, dominion, glory, and a kingdom. And then in verse 14, worshipers, those who will serve him, that is religious language, we'll talk about in a few moments. And then notice the nature of the kingdom. This kingdom is to be everlasting. That is, the king who is to rule over this nation is himself everlasting. He must endure to the extent that the kingdom itself does. And perhaps the pre-eternity of this one is suggested in the fact that he was presented, that is, he already existed. He's not a newcomer to the scene. He's not a newcomer in the universe. He has already been, and he is to rule forever. All of these things indicate that this one is a divine being. And it's interesting that Daniel 7.13 is the only place in the Old Testament where a heavenly being is described as a son of man. One that is said to come on the clouds of heaven. This is a theophany, an appearance of a divine being. By the way, it's not the only place in the Old Testament that you have a multiplicity of divine beings in the same place at the same time. And you might be thinking to yourself, well, how many divine beings are there? And by divine, we mean of the essence of deity, that is God. You know, we talk about chocolate being divine. Some people talk about the divinity in the human. We're not talking about any of that garbage. We're, when we talk about divine, we mean deity, that is, we mean God. And there's a multiplicity of persons here who are ascribed the characteristics of God, who receive the glory only God deserves, who get ascriptions that belong only to him. And yet there is only one God. There are two psalms that give us a, perhaps a parallel to this coronation scene. I want to turn your attention to Psalm 110. Because in both of these psalms, Psalm 110 and Psalm 2, we have a throne room coronation with two divine beings. Very similar realities going on here. Psalm 110, of course, is that most quoted Old Testament text in the New Testament. If you were to ask the New Testament, what is your favorite passage? The New Testament would say Psalm 110. And this is a critical psalm for understanding the New Testament because it is applied to the second person of the Trinity, to the Lord Jesus Christ, and it gives a, a critical understanding to his identity. Psalm 110 says this, Yahweh says to my Adonai. So Yahweh, the personal name of the covenant-keeping God of Israel, the self-existent self one, all capitals in your English Bible, says to my Lord, notice the lowercase O-R-D in the second Lord there. That is the Hebrew word for Adonai. It simply means Lord or Master. And the my there refers to David. Notice the uh, ascription at the top. This is a psalm of David. What is David singing? Yahweh says to my Adonai, to my master. Well, David is top dog in Israel. He doesn't have a king over him. He doesn't have an earthly lord over him. Someone who is Yahweh is speaking to someone else who is David's lord. And Yahweh says to David's Lord, sit at my right hand until I make your enemies a footstool for your feet. Yahweh will stretch forth your strong scepter from Zion, saying, rule in the midst of your enemies. Your people will volunteer freely in the day of your power. In holy array from the womb of the dawn, your youth are to you as the dew. Yahweh has sworn and he will not change his mind. You are a priest forever according to the order of Melchizedek. And then it says, Edonai is at your right hand. That's most likely the, the Lord, David's Lord, is at Yahweh's right hand. And he will shatter kings in the day of his wrath. He will judge among the nations. He will fill them with corpses, shatter the chief men over a broad country. He will drink from the brook by the wayside. Therefore, he will lift up his head. What is this psalm all about? This psalm is about the priest king. By the way, under Mosaic law, you couldn't have a priest who was also a king. That was off limits. The division of responsibilities. 
The Mosaic law had to go away for a priest king to do something very specific. What would that priest king do? Come as a priest who would actually be the sacrifice, lay down his life for his own subjects. And then be the reigning king to whom the kingdom is given. He would crush his enemies in judgment and he would save his people and his victory would be easy. That's what it means to drink by the brook at the end of the battle. What is this scene? Again, you have two divine personages in the throne room of heaven, one speaking to the other, Yahweh God ascribing, giving to this Adonai the kingdom. Turn to Psalm chapter 2. Similar themes here and the same personages. Why are the nations in an uproar? Why are the peoples devising vain things? The kings of the earth take their stand and the rulers take counsel together. Boy, this sounds like the UN. We're, we're world peace. We're getting together. We're, we're making progress. No, they take their counsel against Yahweh and against his anointed. Notice in your uh, English Bibles, anointed is capitalized. They're recognizing the second divine person here in this text. And these kings counsel together against Yahweh and against his anointed. They say, let us tear their fetters apart, cast away their cords from us. We don't want them in charge of us. And God who sits in the heavens laughs. The Lord scoffs at them. He will speak to them in his anger, terrify them in his fury. As for me, I install my king upon Zion, my holy mountain. He says in verse 7, you are my son. So God has a son who's the anointed one who will be king in Zion. And then God warns the kings at the end of the psalm, uh, take discernment, worship Yahweh, do homage to the son. These remarkable psalms point to the same coronation of this divine person we see in Daniel chapter 7. We see the same two personages show up in Revelation 4 and 5. Again, a throne room scene in heaven where God the Father is giving the kingdom and the rulership and the glory to the Son. Who is this one? He is divine. He is God. He is also human. Look at verse 13. Behold, with the clouds of heaven, one like a son of man was coming. Who is it that is coming on the clouds? One like a son of man. We might be expecting here some brilliant, fiery, indescribable vision of a personage unlike anything we could even relate to. But instead, we hear of one like a son of man. This phrase, son of man, is, is an interesting one. The, the, the phrase son of man or sons of men throughout the Old Testament speak of human frailty, human weakness, human limitation. Psalm 8 and Psalm 144 both echo this refrain. What is man that you take knowledge of him, O God, or the son of man that you even think of him? To be a son of a man, to be sons of men or a son of man simply means to be human. Subject to the things humans are subject to. Ecclesiastes 3.19, sons of men are subject to death. Ecclesiastes 9.12, sons of men are subject to calamity of various types. Interestingly, in Isaiah 51.12, son of man means to be like grass, short-lived and not to be feared. Puny. God called the prophet Ezekiel son of man. I counted 93 times. That's interesting. Every time Ezekiel heard from God, God addresses him as son of man, prophesy this. Son of man, say this. Daniel even gets called son of man once in Daniel chapter 8 as a prophet. It merely means that Ezekiel and Daniel are human, subject to human limitations. Who then is this divine figure in Daniel 7.13? Clearly God from this context, and yet called a son of man. Some have suggested, suggested uh, this is an angelic being. 
Some have suggested that the Son of Man here represents the people of God or is perhaps a personification of the nation of Israel. Or maybe this Son of Man figure is a metaphor for a political entity like a kingdom. Of course, none of these things will do because they miss the very clear ascriptions of deity in this text. They miss the personal nature of the individual with singular pronouns and singular responsibilities throughout this text. It really is hard to comprehend a figure who is fully ascribed the attributes of deity in this text and is said to appear in the form of a man. Unless, unless we were talking about the second person of the Trinity who takes on flesh as a man. And it should be no surprise to us that Daniel 7.13 is the most quoted Daniel verse in the New Testament and is ascribed to Jesus over and over and over again. And the title Son of Man, here it's indefinite, one like a Son of Man, becomes definite in the New Testament when Jesus calls himself the Son of Man over and over and over again. I stopped counting how many times. This is Jesus' favorite title for himself. Everywhere he went in his earthly ministry, he called himself the Son of Man. More than any other title. And this title clearly points to Jesus' humanity, his true humanity. In the incarnation, Jesus became a man and it was not some sort of an apparition. It it was not like a human. He was 100% human. God became man. God dwelt among us. He took on flesh, human flesh, with all of its frailty and limitations and humility and weakness, though without sin. In fact, if we want to see what humanity truly is, you look to the Lord Jesus Christ. You want to see what it looks like for man to have been made in the image of God. Look to Jesus Christ, who is the image of God. In man. You want to look to what humanity redeemed in glory will look like. You look to the Lord Jesus Christ, the man. This is a remarkable thing that Jesus called himself. Listen to the way that Jesus spoke of himself as the Son of Man. And and I've categorized all the usage of Christ speaking of himself as Son of Man into, into really a couple of categories. One related to his human weakness. And you can sum these all up as Jesus subject to frailty, subject to human weakness, subject to suffering, vulnerable, Vulnerable to being reviled, mistreated, betrayed, tortured, and killed. And then the other statements of Jesus being called the Son of Man speak more to his glory. Post-death, his resurrection and his ascension. His purpose to save sinners. And ultimately, to come back on the clouds. In the words of Daniel 7.13, on Jesus' lips over and over again in the gospel, that he would return on the clouds and judge. Jesus is said to come on the clouds. Even as the God the Father was said to be in the clouds. Mark 13, 26, they will see the Son of Man coming in clouds with great power and glory. Acts 1, 9, after Jesus said these things, he was lifted up while they were looking on, and a cloud received him out of their sight. And they said, men of Galilee, why do you stand looking into the sky? This Jesus who has been taken up from you into heaven will come in just the same way as you've watched him go into heaven. He'll come back on the clouds. Revelation 14, 14, I looked and behold a white cloud and sitting on the cloud was one like a son of man holding a golden crown on his head and a sharp sickle in his hand. Matthew 26, 64, Jesus said, you've said it yourself. I tell you hereafter, you will see the son of man sitting at the right hand of power and coming on the clouds of heaven. And there Jesus combined Psalm 110, seated at the right hand of God after his priestly work of sacrificing himself was done, ascending in glory at the right hand of the father and then returning on the clouds of heaven, combining Psalm 110 and Daniel 7, 13. 
And then in Matthew 24, 30, Jesus says, The sign of the Son of Man will appear in the sky, and all the tribes of the earth will mourn, and they will see the Son of Man coming on the clouds of the sky with power and great glory. And there Jesus combines Daniel 7, 13 with Zechariah 12, 10. Zechariah 12, 10 is that great promise that says that Israel will repent one day nationally. They will look on Yahweh whom they have pierced and mourn for him as for an only son. And what Jesus adds to it in the New Testament revelation is not only will Israel mourn for Yahweh whom they pierced as for an only son, but that all the nations will mourn as well. This son of man, fully God, fully human, is the king who will come to fulfill all these things. But listen to the ways that Jesus talked about himself as son of man in his earthly ministry. Matthew 8, 20. The foxes have holes and the birds of the air have nests, but the son of man has nowhere to lay his head. Isn't that interesting? The rightful owner of all things by creative fiat and by sovereign ownership when he was here on the earth amongst his own creatures didn't have a place to lay his head. Just as Jonah was three days and three nights in the belly of the sea monster, so the Son of Man will be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. Speaking of his death. While on the earth, the Son of Man had authority, listen to Matthew 9, 6, so that you may know that the Son of Man has authority on the earth to forgive sins. Matthew 12, 8, the Son of Man is Lord of the Sabbath. Listen to his humility and suffering, Matthew 17, 12. I say to you, Elijah already came, and they did not recognize him. They did whatever they wished. So also the Son of Man is going to suffer at their hands. Matthew 20, verse 18. Behold, we are going up to Jerusalem, and the Son of Man will be delivered to the chief priests and scribes. They will condemn him to death. Jesus asked Judas, are you coming to betray the Son of Man with a kiss? Why did Jesus do all of this? Mark 10, 45. The Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life a ransom for many. Matthew 18, 11, The Son of Man has come to save that which is lost. Luke 9, 22, the Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders, the chief priests, and the scribes, and be killed and be raised up on the third day. What will the Son of Man do? He must be lifted up. And the Jewish notions in the days of Jesus' earthly ministry had already connected Psalm 2, Daniel 7, 13, and Psalm 110 into a trifecta of identity. That is, the Messiah, the anointed one, the expected one, the king who would come to set Israel free from governmental oppression of the times of the Gentiles. That one would be son of David, son of God, and one like a son of man. Jesus affirms all of these things in his earthly ministry, quoting Daniel 7, 13, to do just that. What was Jesus doing when he appeals to Daniel 7, 13? By the way, there's no other text in the Old Testament that Jesus can be referring to when he calls himself the Son of Man, because there is no other text in the Old Testament where a divine being gets that name, and it is associated in Jesus' words with the coming in glory on the clouds. What does all this mean? Jesus is calling himself son of man, particularly to identify himself as the one to whom the ancient of days gives the glory and the dominion and the kingdom. To identify himself with the one who comes in the glory on the clouds, the one to whom is given a kingdom of worshipers from every tongue and tribe and nation and people. And nobody gets worshiped but God. In a very real sense, the title of Son of Man, the Son of Man, in the Gospels of Christ is an ascription of his deity. He is called the Son of Man. That is a unique Son of Man, unlike all the other sons of men that have been. 
And the tie to Daniel 7.13 makes that title not only a title of his true humanity, but an ascription of his deity. And no one else can fit the bill. No one else could save sinners from their sin, but the God-man, the one mediator between God and man, the man Christ Jesus. This glorious one, with the right to approach the Ancient of Days, coronated as ruler over God's unending kingdom, who will come with the clouds of heaven, this Son of Man, this second person of the Trinity, is the God of Israel who himself will come to shepherd his people, will come on the clouds of heaven and rule on the earth. And this God in the flesh king, to whom is due all honor and glory and dominion and power, is the one who came first to seek and to save the lost, to be betrayed, to suffer, and to die at the hands of sinners, to be reviled, ignored, misunderstood, to have a blindfold placed over his eyes and to be beaten, to have a mock scepter placed in his hand and a purple robe on his torn flesh and a crown of thorns pounded into his head. To be nailed to a Roman cross, a cruel form of execution as a common criminal with a plaque over the top. You remember what it said? It was true. The king of Israel. He was brought low. You're familiar with Isaiah 53. There probably is no better description of the gospel in its totality and in one place than Isaiah 53. But you might remember that the song of the suffering servant begins in Isaiah 52. Listen to Isaiah 52, 13. Behold, my servant will prosper. He will be high and lifted up and greatly exalted. Just as many were astonished at you, my people, so his appearance was marred more than any man and his form more than the sons of men. There's that son of man language again, being used of Messiah in his humiliation, in his marring beyond recognition. So that just as people in the world looked at the nation Israel and said, look how far they've gone, how terrible they must be cursed. So they looked at Israel's Messiah and saw him marred beyond recognition and said he must be cursed of God. This glorious one was brought to ignominy, shame. <laughs> Can these things be true of the same person? Glorious and humble? Terrifying and tender? Well, yes, of course, these glorious excellencies find themselves together in one remarkable person. Turn to Revelation chapter 5. Here again is another one of these heavenly throne room coronation scenes with two persons of the Trinitarian Godhead, two divine personages, both in the same place at the same time. And John, the revelator, records this. Revelation 5, verse 1, I saw in the right hand of him who sat on the throne, that is God the Father, a book written inside and on the back, sealed up with seven seals. And I saw a strong angel proclaiming with a loud voice, who's worthy to open the book and to break its seals? Probably who is worthy to unroll the scroll. And no one in heaven or on earth or under the earth was able to open the scroll or even to look into it. John says, I began to weep greatly because no one was found worthy to open the scroll or look into it. Why is John weeping? I believe this scroll contains the right, glorious, just, and beautiful vindication of the glory of God. It is the unfolding of the end of human history, the end of the age of man in the judgments of God that unfold in the great tribulation, Revelation 6 through 18 which precede the glorious return of Messiah in chapter 19. God must judge. 
He must judge the earth dwellers who rebel against him and who revile him with every breath they take of his oxygen on his green earth. God must have his day. The day of the Lord must come. And John is weeping because who is worthy to bring about such judgment? No angel, no human, no saint absent from the body present with the Lord is worthy to bring about such judgment. Angels are finite beings and any redeemed human is a sinner. And one of the elders said to John, stop weeping. Behold, there, behold, look, John, someone's worthy. Who is it? Of course, it's the lion from the tribe of Judah. Strong, mighty, powerful, ferocious, terrifying. That is the one to bring about judgment. He is the root of David. That's an interesting reference. In the Old Testament, this one is called the branch of David. That is, he's a descendant of David. But he's also, in the Old Testament, called the root of David. How is someone to be the predecessor of David, the creator of David, and the descendant of David? Again, only the God-man. Only Christ fits this bill. He alone is worthy. He is the one who overcame so as to open the scroll and its seven seals. Only Jesus, John 5, 26, as the Father has rendered all judgment to the Son, only Jesus is worthy to bring about the unfolding of this cataclysmic judgment on the earth dwellers from God's holy wrath. So John looks, and I saw between the throne, and the throne had the four living creatures and the elders, I saw a lamb standing as if slain. Can you imagine the scene? Judgment must come. We're looking for the lion of the tribe of Judah. Yes, he's worthy. And John turns around and looks, and what does he see? A lamb still bearing the marks of his slaughter. This is staggering. That the lion of the tribe of Judah, worthy of all glory, from whom the scepter would never depart, was the lamb slain from the foundation of the world. The one who will judge all is the one who himself was first judged by God for the sins of those who would believe. What a staggering picture of the Lord Jesus Christ. There's no one better. Jonathan Edwards commenting on this very verse, describing the intricate differences between lions and lambs. One is the top of the food chain and the other is a victim. And if we could paraphrase Jonathan Edwards, we might say that a, a lamb is kind of like a marshmallow on toothpicks in the animal world. What's it good for? Eating and sacrifice and in the sacrificial system, substitution. The, the kind of animal that, that doesn't say anything when you slit its throat. Kind of animal that doesn't complain when it is shorn of its wool. And Jesus, as a lamb, did not complain when he went to his own brutal death in the place of the guilty. He is divine and human. <laughs> He is the lion and the lamb, and could ever such divergent excellencies be found in one person? Yes, they are only found in Jesus Christ. And so Jonathan Edwards, remarking on this verse, says, Would you look anywhere else for a Savior? What more could you want in a Savior? Why would you turn to anybody other than Christ? Glorious and humble, terrifying and tender. Listen, these same virtues appear for us in Philippians chapter 2. Paul, there enjoining Christians to be humble, says, Be like Christ, who, existing in the form of God, did not regard equality with God a thing to be grasped after, but he emptied himself, taking the form of a slave, being made in the likeness of men, being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. Verse 9, for this reason, God highly exalted him. 
Just where Isaiah 52, 12 started. My servant will be highly exalted. How? Low humiliation, marred beyond all recognition, bearing the transgressions of God's people to whom the stroke was due. The glory of Christ revealed in his humility. Subjects of a king are, are subject to a king. They lay down their lives for kings. But this king laid down his life for his subjects. What will his kingdom be like? Verse 14, Daniel 7. To him was given dominion, glory, and a kingdom that all the peoples, nations, and men of every language might serve him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion which will not pass away. His kingdom is one which will not be destroyed. How do we describe this kingdom? It is tangible, universal, religious, and everlasting. This Daniel 7 vision lays the foundation for messianic expectation. You read the rabbis between the testaments. You you read the apocalyptic literature like the book of Enoch between the testaments. And they refer to this text over and over again. And they put together the ideas of son of David, son of man, son of God in their conception of Messiah. And then the very things this Messiah is said to do are laid out in this text. Bring about a kingdom, a real one, a terrestrial one on the earth. One that will span the entire globe. One that will bring about worship and one that will never end. Notice first it is tangible. To him is given dominion, glory, and a kingdom. Dominion is authority to govern. Glory is the honor due the one in that high position. And kingdom is the actual administration of rulership. It is organized, tangible, administrated. It's not a metaphor for something else. It's an actual kingdom. And it is a good one. (laughs) You read all the Old Testament descriptions of this coming kingdom, and all problems are solved. World peace exists. Humanity flourishes in the way that God intended man to be a subregion under his reign on his earth. To reflect his selfless love and his humility and the glory of what it means to be man made in his image. And all of that, as Revelation 20 tells us, for a thousand years, it will be real. You remember the disciples' prayer, or what is popularly called the Lord's Prayer in Matthew chapter 6. Do you remember the doxology where it ends? And yours, I want to sing it, I'm not going to sing it. Yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. That's a reference here to Daniel 7.14. The same words are used. Think about the Great Commission, Matthew 28, 18. All authority, Jesus said, in heaven and on earth has been given to me. That's exactly what's happening in this scene. The Ancient of Days is giving all dominion and glory and authority to the Lord Jesus Christ. And what is the Great Commission all about? Populating that kingdom which is to come with citizens worthy, citizens forgiven, citizens given the white robes of Jesus Christ in preparation for citizenship in that day. This is more than just the sovereignty of God over all things. This is physical, tangible, and manifest. This is more than simply the reign of God in the hearts of his people. This is a kingdom coming to earth to hold sway over every inhabitant, to be seen and to be felt and to be lived in. God's behind-the-scenes operational sovereignty becomes visible and tangible and terrestrial. It is also universal. All the peoples, nations, men of every language. This is familiar language. The book of Revelation picks this up again and again. It will encompass every ethnicity, every nationality, and every language. By the way, national and ethnic distinctions still exist into the millennial kingdom and in some texts even into the eternal state. There's something about the Tower of Babel where man tried to do his own thing and went to separate languages and separate geographies and then parted themselves off in such different ways. And in God's redemption of humanity, he doesn't make the human uh, ethnicity monolithic. 
but redeems people from every tongue and tribe and nation and people. And we see that here. Jesus will be king over all. And this will be a universal rule over all the inhabited earth, one world united in one politic under one good king. It will also be religious. And I mean religious in the best sense of that word. Look at verse 14, that they might serve him. The word serve him appears nine times in the book of Daniel. It always refers to the reverence given to deity or fake deities. It is a word used for cultic or, or um, uh, religious service worship. And what will all the peoples and tongues and nations do? They will worship this son of man. And it will be unending or everlasting. Notice his dominion is an everlasting dominion. It will not pass away. It will not be destroyed. Three descriptions piled up to describe an unending, unalterable reign. And we become accustomed to change, flux in governments, unpredictable and inconsistent laws, tyrants with temper tantrums, selfish despots, bulky bureaucracies, election cycles that result in various swings in economies, pocket lining legislators, red tape and revolutions. We've seen it and we've seen it again. Even the best ideas in human government decay, come up with the best human government there's ever been and it will fall apart. They're all subject to the same internal rot that caused them all to break down. But the reign of the last king will be good, and it will stay good. It'll be forever, an everlasting dominion, the text says. It will not collapse or deteriorate or crumble. It cannot be lost or taken or overthrown or voted out. Why? Because it does not possess the internal flaw, the internal fatal flaw of every prior government, that Achilles heel that brings them all down, the fly in the ointment that corrupts every attempt at human governance, sin in the heart of every ruler and sinners at the helm of every government. This is what it's meant, and that it will not be destroyed. The, the verb there for will not be destroyed is an intensive, reflexive verb that could be translated, it will not destroy itself, with exclamation points. It doesn't have in itself the very thing that brings governments down. It's unlike everything prior. When the last king comes, he will establish a kingdom not from around here. Remember what Jesus said? My kingdom is not of this world. He didn't say there, by the way, that my kingdom's not coming. Oh, his kingdom's coming. It's just not from around here. This fits the Daniel 2 description of the stone cut out without hands that comes not from here and it comes to here and it smashes, pulverizes all previous human kingdoms to powder. What is the good news of the kingdom? The authority and sovereign power of our good God will be manifest on the earth. And that's good news. Just a theological implication here for a moment. The fifth kingdom is not the church. These details don't fit the first coming of Messiah when he came in his humiliation and his suffering. The church doesn't displace beast number four. How do we know that? It was the Roman Empire that crucified Messiah, and it was the Roman Empire that continued in strength for another 500 years, slowly dissipated by some guys with spray paint. Not really spray paint. We call them the vandals, where it's where we get vandalism. They didn't just spray paint Rome. They, they attacked it, little bits and pieces. Rome crumbled internally. I'm getting ahead of myself. We'll get to the fall of the Roman Empire in two weeks. But for now, just know that a, a slow decay of the Roman Empire that really culminated in the end of the 1500s may even be said to have morphed into the Holy Roman Empire, or the Roman Catholic Church, and still stand, stands in some strange sense. It was not destroyed by the church, and it was not destroyed quickly, catastrophically, suddenly. It was not coincident with the end of all those other empires, and the result was not the universal kingdom of Christ present now. That kingdom is not yet manifest. God, Jesus' disciples are to pray for it to come. The four prior kingdoms were symbolized by beasts, but those symbols represented actual empires on the earth. The fifth kingdom coming, the kingdom of Messiah, will likewise be obvious, physical, territorial, terrestrial, an actual government administered on the earth by the last king. And you may be asking, why isn't our present age depicted in Daniel? Have you ever wondered that? 
We end with the, uh, the beast 1.0 with still yet future beast 4 2.0. Where's the revived Roman Empire? And why is there a revived Roman Empire when it just seems like there's one beast in two phases? Why aren't they like right one after another? Am I, have, you, have you asked that question, wondered that question? There's a gap here. What is that gap? That gap is the mystery the Old Testament didn't reveal, the mystery of the church age the mystery of the church as an organism out from under Mosaic law that is Jew and Gentile together in one body as the people of God populating the future kingdom to come by gospel proclamation of a suffering Messiah. That's where we're at. You want the you are here map with the arrow. You are here in the church age, the mystery that the Old Testament prophets didn't reveal. Well, how do we know there's that big gap if you'll indulge me for a moment, I want to show you that gap in two places. Turn to Isaiah 61. This pattern where Daniel has back-to-back -back prophecies that seem like it just goes from one to another, and yet we look at it and we think, oh, it's separated by about 2,000 years at least. Who knows how much more? This is a readily apparent feature of Old Testament prophecies. And I've used this illustration before. If you're in Santan Valley and you're looking towards the north and you see mountain ranges and you see one that looks like this. That's four peaks and superstitions. And from Santan Valley, it looks like one piece of rock, especially around sunset. But if you drive up Beeline Highway, you find out, whoa, the Four Peaks and the Superstition Mountains are separated by a lot of space. Actually, they're not really close to each other at all. But from a vantage point far away, they look like the same thing. That is a regular feature in Old Testament predictive prophecy. Look at Isaiah 61. By the way, here's another place where we see multiple personalities of divine beings in the triune Godhead in one place in the Old Testament. The Spirit of Edonai Yahweh, the spirit of the Lord Yahweh, is upon me because Yahweh has anointed me to bring good news to the afflicted, has sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to captives and freedom to prisoners, to proclaim the favorable year of Yahweh and the day of vengeance of our God. And this is in the suffering servant section of, of uh, Isaiah. Me here is the suffering servant, the same one from Isaiah 53. So the spirit of Yahweh is upon Christ. And what is Christ anointed for? To bring good news to the afflicted, bind up the brokenhearted, proclaim liberty to captives, freedom to prisoners, the favorable year of the Lord, and the day of vengeance of our God. Keep your finger in that text for just a moment and look over at Luke chapter 4. I know we're in overtime here. Jesus is preaching in Galilee in a synagogue. And the scroll of the prophet Isaiah is handed to him. He opens the scroll and he finds this place. He finds Isaiah 61, 1 and 2. And notice, he reads it. The spirit of Yahweh is upon me because he anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He sent me to proclaim release to the captives, recovery of sight to the blind, to set free those who are oppressed, to proclaim the favorable year of the Lord, period, end quote, verse 20. And he closed the book, gave it back to the attendant and sat down and the eyes of all in the synagogue were fixed on him. And he said, today, this scripture has been fulfilled in your hearing. This is amazing. This is amazing. And, and again, if we go back to Isaiah 61, we make a startling discovery. Jesus put a period in the middle of a verse and ended the quote and sat down. Wait, Jesus, aren't you going to finish the sentence? Isaiah 61, 2 finishes with, and the day of vengeance of our God. You're, you're coming to, to preach good news, to set captives free, to, to, to talk grace, the favorable year of the Lord. Man, this is all coming. The, the kingdom's coming. Messiah's kingdom's coming. And vengeance against the enemies. Jesus leaves out the vengeance part. Why did he do that? Why did he put a period there, close the scroll, hand it back to the attendant? 
Because this is the gap between first advent, second advent, in Isaiah 61, 1 and 2, in the middle of verse 2, at least 2,000 years, right in between the middle of a verse. And Jesus makes that clear. This is reflected in the very thing he said, I have come to cast fire on the earth, how I wish it were already kindled, but I have a baptism to undergo, and how distressed a soul am I until it happens. He's got to go to the cross before he brings the fire. The one who is the judge of all men came to be judged in believer's place first. That prophetic split. You can write, we won't go through it, but write down Zechariah 9, 9 and 10 and John 12, 15. Zechariah 9 and John 12. Same feature there. Jesus comes in on a colt, the foal of a donkey, and he's bringing fire. But they're split between Jesus' first coming and his second coming. What we see in Daniel 7, 13 is the coronation ceremony, the giving of all authority and glory and dominion and power and a kingdom and a kingdom of nation, tribes, tongues, and people of worshipers who will bring glory to the Lord Jesus Christ, God's Messiah, his anointed, well before it happens. <laughs> it's the parade it's the trophy presentation. And you know what that does for our beleaguered hearts under beastly human governments? I'll give you Dale Ralph Davis's take. He says, seeing the secret behind history may not keep God's people from pain, but should keep them from panic. It's helpful. Lord, we thank you so much that you are indeed sovereign. You didn't have to tell us the future. We could just trust you because you are trustworthy. And yet you have given us these things to stay our hearts, to anchor our souls in tumultuous times. When we're tempted to open the newspaper, to look at headlines and to scroll through troubling discoveries day after day after day. And none of these things are outside of your plan. None of these things are outside of your control. No king can outsmart you. You will have your day. Hold every king accountable. You will rescue your people. You will establish your glorious reign on the earth. And that reign that you begin that lasts on this earth for a thousand years will then extend into eternity forever and ever and ever. And it will be all good. We thank you that you are king. We pray, O oh God, that you would rescue any sinner who has come here tonight who rightly sees their sin as an obstacle to citizenship in your kingdom, who are rightly terrified by the fiery one who will judge the thoughts and intentions of every heart. And may they find in that lion of the tribe of Judah, the avenger of God's glory, the punisher of God's enemies. May they find in you, Lord Jesus, a slaughtered lamb, an innocent substitute to take away the sins of anyone who would turn to you in faith. Would you be pleased to give new life and citizenship in your kingdom through your blood? It's in your name we pray it. Amen.